Hello again. Uh, I'll repeat that. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for New York Public Radio. We are one of the oldest media uh, businesses in New York, and in fact, that's one of the things that created a lot of design challenges for us that we're going to talk about today. I'm not a designer by trade. I'm a marketer, but design is very much a part of what we do, and I brought a real designer with me here today. Sahar Barlu is our head of design, and she's going to be speaking for a little bit as well. Um, where I think this conversation might be a little different than what you often hear at these events is what I want to talk about is how design for us starts with research, extends into not just graphical design and UX design, but sound design, because we live in the world of sound. And um, I'm going to show you a short film at the end of this that goes deep into how we create the sounds for one of our most popular shows, Radiolab, um, which is one of the many podcasts that we create. So to start things off, um, we are a 93-year-old uh, media company and uh, with a legacy that goes back to the very earliest days of radio. We actually have hanging in the office the very first um, rundown of our first day on the air, July 8th, 1924. And it's fascinating to look at it because among other things that you might notice is that a half an hour into the very first broadcast, we had a technical problem and went off the air. So it's funny that in technology, sort of things never change. It was sort of like a beta test. We went out there, we tried it. Um, but, you know, so the photo there is of uh, Mayor LaGuardia, uh, who used to go on the radio all the time. During the Great Depression, he was on WNYC talking about uh, trying to give hope to New Yorkers. During the newspaper strike in the 40s, he would read the, the comics to the kids. And this wonderful legacy has some uh, sort of design challenges for us because a lot of people think of us as that, as like a black and white photo uh, from the 1920s or 30s, when in fact, if you look at us now, we're a much different place. We're a much more diverse company. We are a lot more modern. We're actually doing really inventive things. So we wanted to explore that uh, uh, from a uh, design standpoint. We started talking to listeners and non-listeners alike in New York City and asking them, like, what do you think of this thing? A lot of brand people might uh, talk about brands in terms of a person. And we asked people, like, if WNYC was a person, if the brand was a person, what would they look like? What kind of clothes do they wear? Are they male? Are they female? Are they young? Are they old? How do they talk? And what came back was essentially Kelsey Grammer in, in his, <laughs> it was Frasier. It was an Upper West Side white middle-aged male who listens to classical music and has a bow tie. And I'm like, ugh, that's not us. That isn't us. And how do I express what we really are in terms of design? Um, when we ask people, again, like, what do, you, what do you like about us? What do we mean to you? Uh, these are actual people and actual quotes. We heard a lot of stuff about, well, you know, you guys are really part of New York. It's as much of New York as a slice of pizza or a bagel or a ride on the subway. It's part of the fabric of the city and the life of the city. And we all heard, heard a lot also about, um, about being part of a conversation, that WNYC was a place where people would come to hear sort of like authentic, uh, conversations about New York and our political life and, and, and civic life. And in digesting that, it, you began to come up with a, sort of a, a positioning statement or a thing that kind of set who we are, who our personality was, both in terms of our programming and our design. And it was certain words that came up again and again. It was courageous, it was independent, it was gritty. Independent because we're not owned by uh, a big corporate overlord. We're not part of like Clear Channel. We are owned by the basically the people of the city of New York who donate to us all the time. And uh, you know, gritty came up a lot because people who heard the program said, "Well, I, I hear you guys go up against the mayor, and you like really hold his feet to the fire, and you know, you do the kind of shows, you have conversations that people normally wouldn't have." So, building on these design ideas uh, set the stage for who we say we are. Uh, as an expression of, um, of both our advertising and our design and our sound design, as we're going to hear in a moment. So courageous conversation lives here is, is sort of one of the principal brand ideas that we had. And that gets expressed in several ways, uh, one of which uh, was this ad campaign that ran, um, uh, started uh, last spring, it ran throughout the winter, and you're going to see some new ads coming out very soon. But, you know, when you look at them, what, what do you see? Uh, well, they're all expressions of New York, more or less. They all try to have this sort of um, 
uh, design style of, New York, of things that reminds us of the city. Um, they have black and white photography. They were often kind of gritty. And we wanted to have somewhat um, uh, provocative headlines that sounded like the kinds of conversations we were having with people who listened to us all the time. Um, and we're trying to break uh, this uh, perception of public radio as being kind of staid and conservative and safe and something that your parents would listen to. So the headlines actually, when you know the whole Russia thing was breaking, we had this like shirtless Putin thing saying, you know, more influential than Russia. It was getting photographed and tweeted and Instagrammed around, and people were saying, "My God, I can't believe that's actually you guys saying it." Um, other public radio stations looked at it almost with horror, saying, how could you guys go there? Because we don't talk like that. And we said, but we do talk like that in New York. Um, fake news came out. Again, we talked about, well, selling fake bags on the, hand, on the sidewalk. And uh, this other one uh, you'll start seeing in the subways pretty soon uh, of courageous conversation isn't your thing. Sorry, not sorry. We tell it like it is. Uh, so we're starting to express this notion of who we are and who the brand is through sort of some visual design. But the audio design component of this, I think, is interesting as well and worth, worth exploring. If you look at our logo, it's actually one of my favorite logos, and the designers will probably speak to it more. I love it because it sizes really well, but also because it seems to indicate a couple of different things. It shows it's like the skyline of New York, but it's also sound bars bouncing around. And when we started to look at the logo, that we, uh, we wanted to design um, a sound, an audio logo to go along with it. So what's the design equivalent of that in audio? And I'm going to play it, and I hope it plays well um, on this. If you listen to the notes and you look at the steps of the logo, you'll see they, they match um, each other well. Uh-oh, uh here we go. I'll play it again because it sounds like we missed the, the first part of the note. But you can hear the steps are proportionately the same musically as they are graphically in that. Um, so I'll play it again. All right, so those are the hero tones. Now, taking that as like a foundation, the same way a graphical designer might say, like, here's my color palette and how do I build upon it? We took that musical palette and felt like, well, how do we build on these notes further? And, say, and, and also using these same uh, sort of design aesthetics in sound, right? So if we wanted an on-air sound that reflects what we're saying graphically, that we are reflecting sort of New York values and we're of the people and we want to be a little, you know, maybe a little more gritty, one of the things we did is we took off the air all the like, professional voiceovers that used to have at the top of the hour that say the brand ID. And what we started to do is we go out into the field when we're at an event or something like that, and we intercept people on the street and we have them record. We, have them, we give them a script and they record it. And then we combine the voices of real New Yorkers with musical compositions that are based on those notes. And again, if I get, you'll hear. This is WNYC, FM, HD, and AM New York. And you can hear in the background the sound of like children playing. We have ones where you have the sound of a diner. We have ones where you hear the subway running by. So there are all these sort of like little musical cues or like design cues of New York embedded in that. And we have um, you know, almost 80 of these things. And they have different accents. And some people who could you know, hardly speak you know, English at all. Again, violating a lot of the rules of um, traditional radio. Uh, whoops, that was a mistake. It was supposed to play another thing. Um, but it said a lot about who we were as a brand, who we were as a design brand. Um, this next slide is from an article in the New York Times when we uh, began, uh, we started a new studio within WNYC, a podcast studio. This is two years ago. And uh, WNYC Studios was launching as a very different brand from WNYC, the radio station. WNYC Radio, as I said, is New York. It's local. We talk about local politics. WNYC Studios is the production home of a lot of the nationally uh, broadcast and uh, podcast shows that you might know, like Radiolab and Freakonomics. And here's the thing with Alec Baldwin, the two dope queens. 
you know, on and on. So it starts to have a very different personality. So as a design-wise, marketing-wise, we're like, uh-oh, I have to now create another brand that is somehow linked to this New York brand, but not so tied to it as to look like it's provincial and, and can't expand to grow with a portfolio, which is much more diverse than um, what we've got going on. So voila, WNYC Studios. If you'll actually notice, uh, you know, it's got the roots of the, of the radio logo sort of knocked out and reversed and much more modern type. But we also made it so that it could sit on different colored backgrounds, and Sahar's gonna talk a little bit about the color scheme for this. We went with very different colors, right? Um, the palette here are these sort of neon-y colors. We have a lot of sort of pinks and violets and sort of like lime green, uh, in a way to reflect the diversity of the, of the portfolio that sits within WNYC Studios, which includes our LGBTQ podcast and a lot of other things. Um, so here, too, then, you have not just a design, um, sort of a new design um, palette that you're beginning, but another uh, audio palette that you're going to start to grow. Um, so here we wanted to design an audio logo that reflects um, the WNYC Studios brand. So for one thing, it's designed for headphones. So this is not going to play well in this, um, in this uh, particular venue because you won't hear the sort of the little stereo tricks that are happening in that. But it grows from the audio stuff that you heard before. You'll hear in the background, again, sort of like New York-y sounds. There's like little wind chimes in the distance, a dog barking in an alley, and a subway passing by. Uh, and it moves from like one channel to the next. So it's rooted in New York still, but it has, a, a, um, in a way, a much more universal sound to it because the voiceover, uh, this is Glenn Washington, who does a show called Snap Judgment. Um, and um, let me play that for you here. So here we go. Listener supported, WNYC Studios. Again, sort of hard to hear, but now that that's began an entire sort of audio design um, uh, foundation for a lot of things that the studios does. And that is an outgrowth of our biggest show, um, Radio Lab, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. I'm going to show you something about designing the audio for that, which is incredibly intense. So uh, once we started to have this like palette, um, the design of the stuff in the studios went in a sort of dramatically different direction. So we just did a, uh, a podcasting festival in Los Angeles. Um, this is from the New York one. We just did it last week in Los Angeles uh, for women podcasters. And you could see how the Knockout logo sits on sort of brightly colored uh, design, um, uh, you know, uh, colors, and that the graphical treatment of this is much more sort of modern and a little more um, almost like uh, like almost like collage, right? Which is something we're going to use um, across the different shows and. Um, what started to happen is, unlike designing for big out-of-home posters for the radio, is we found ourselves designing for really, really tiny spaces because this entire brand, for the most part, lives in the iTunes uh, store and in the podcast app on your phone. So it's smaller even than the app itself. It's like a sub-part of an already small thing. So how do we design for that? So for this, I'm going to pass it over to Sahar to talk a little bit about the design. Can everyone hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear myself. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Sahar Baharilu, and I'm the manager for, of design and brand at New York Public Radio. So my job is very strange. I make pictures for audio, um, but it's really fun. Um, and here is how we uh, started branding all of our um, social platforms with some uh, nice color. And you can see how we've been branding the individual podcasts for Note WNYC Studios. And I'm going to be talking about um, this particular problem of scale in uh, iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify. So initially, we need, so we, once we launched the studio, we needed to brand all of our podcasts and show that they're being made by WNYC Studios and not WNYC anymore, and that we're not NPR, which is always a problem that we have. How many of you guys thought Radiolab was made by NPR? Yeah. <laughs> 
So we initially did it this way with our mark in the upper corner and it looked really great in large scales. In fact, if you've seen some of the Spotify ads in the subway, um, you can see it really big and it looks beautiful, but the problem is when it scales down, it completely falls apart. And most people look at their podcast art from a they pull out of their pocket that's really, really, really small. So it was fall completely falling apart, so we were like, oh man, <laughs> what are we gonna do? We have so many different shows to different audiences, like on the media is very different than Nancy, which is really different than uh, There Goes the Neighborhood, so we needed to find a way to brand all of these things consistently. So I just simply took the beautiful sound thing that Peter was just talking about off. <laughs> it's there most of the time. We have rules of when we use it and when we don't use it. But this way we have everything really clear at the bottom. Um, not only can the mark get bigger, so you can read WNYC Studios more clearly, all of the logos are, the show logos themselves are bigger. So you can see here that um, Death, Sex, and Money's logo could be bigger, which is really important for the With Anna sale because it's microscopic on a very small thing. And this is such a, this is such a big design challenge for me because when we had the old template, I couldn't use the top fourth of a square. So it was hard to fit, say, someone's face plus the logo plus WMAC Studios is becoming a Tetris, and this way it became much cleaner. And it also allowed us to co-brand things much easier, which we are doing more and more of. You can see here with a piece of work, which we did with MoMA, that came out earlier this year. And then there goes the neighborhood LA with KCRW. And um, I'm gonna give it back to Peter. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, what is that? This is a screenshot of Jad Abumrad's computer when he's editing. Uh, this is from uh, More Perfect, which is a show about the Supreme Court that we do. And if you've ever edited uh, video or audio, you could kind of tell like every single line of this is another channel of thing that he's added. So this might be a snippet of sound, that might be part of an interview, that might be a different part of an interview, and it runs linearly. So, why do I show that? But part because it's hard to illustrate how complex designing sound can be until you see it laid out like that. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is a little piece that we did recently with Radiolab um, where we're going to take you inside a little bit. There's some talking, but I think what's interesting is you get to hear Jad himself talk about the process of creating the soundscapes. And you'll hear uh, Dylan Keefe, who's our design, our audio designer, talk about how he creates some of the music and sound effects and, uh, uh, that go into an episode of Radio Lab, and really every show that we produce at WNYC Studios. So here again, I need to find my mouse, and here we go. The word hit us like you're hit with a, with a bullet. The stories we do now are in a different category. We're actually trying to discover things. It's some kind of weird collision between science and philosophy, music and interviews and drama. That's part of the beauty of Radiolab is that it somehow creates all of these different fascinating problems and in challenges. Now in Owen's case, he had these movies. He could play them again and again and again. And we wondered, why would that be? And why and how could a Disney movie help Owen with his autism? Nobody would set out to make a show like Radio Lab. Like that, whose, whose plan would be, let's make this really production intensive audio program. It grew up really organically because we felt like there was a need for it and it was what we wanted to make. There's about a million and a half listeners a week on the radio. And then there's also the podcast audience where we are frequently in the top 10 of iTunes podcasts. I think part of why it sounds different than everything else on the radio is that Jad is a composer and the musical sensibility of the show is just part of its DNA. We don't do live. You, have you guys ever talked to each other? I don't think so, no. Oh, this, so this is Chad Abunrod. Well, hi. This is Jim Glick. Hey, how are you? Fine, how are you? Pretty good, pretty good. Rainbow. Rainbow. 
telling stories is a deeply musical act no matter what. It's pitches, contours of sounds, rhythm. A lot of it is trying to get the textures and the ingredients to behave the way you want them to, which I imagine is like a chef's problem. You know, they're, you're constantly, like the way they poke at meat to figure out if it's done, you're constantly doing that with the sound. Like, you're putting stuff in, saying, ah, does it feel big enough, it feel thick enough? There's a real art to being able to tell a storyline and have music sort of bubble underneath the surface and always propping up the story, always propping up the characters that are in it. Music becomes a metaphor for me. It becomes a way of translating some of these ideas. We did a show about colors. You can't even really see colors on the radio. What does a mantis shrimp see when it looks at the rainbow? Uh, there's no way to answer that question without seeing it. Three, two, one. We used a variety of musical metaphors and we orchestrated a whole choir with different bands of the visual spectrum. Each cluster of voices represented one band. Insanely red. Three, two, one. Well, he's taken three different things. He's taken two you just learned that there are creatures out there who can see colors that we can't even imagine. Robert's like a living cartoon character. He can generate all these crazy voices in his head. He's a great improviser. Jad's a composer. So when we all came together and Jad and Robert for the first time made something, it was like Jad was able to take the voices that were inside Robert's head and recontextualize them in a way that sounded surreal and something new and, and different. When we look for a new story in our editorial meeting, we're looking for does it hit all of these different sectors? Can it take you to a specific place? Can it create specific images in your mind? And is there some kind of big idea? We love stories where you're left wondering, how do I feel about this? People sometimes tell me it's a very visual show. That's part of like the connection of listening, is that, like you're seeing things and you can't help but see things. That's half the battle, you know, is about making those images come alive, which is weird because you're working in radio. You know, there are no pictures here. But in some weird, more cosmic way, I feel like the lack creates this vacuum that then two people have to fill. You, the storyteller, and the person listening. And there's something deeply empathic about that, that like we're doing it together. You're listening, listening to Radio Lab. So sound, art, it's all kind of telling a story, right? You're taking these base ingredients and you're trying to uh, manipulate them to craft an emotion in somebody's mind at the end of the day. So we do it both visually and we really spend most of our lives doing it in audio, trying to compose someone's imagination and broadcast it out. So that's what we came here to say. Um, I have a couple of minutes if you want to do uh, questions now. Uh, happy to talk to you about anything. So. Right, yeah. Well, we do, like most marketers, you do pre and post surveys um, uh, and look for attitudinal shifts over the many different runs of this. But perhaps the most um, meaningful metric is that if you look at our ratings, um, we just had the highest ratings in the history of the company in June, and the, uh, the quotient of, of audiences shifted dramatically, that for the first time, in I don't know how long, that our second largest audience bucket is actually 25 to 34. Um, so our audience has become younger and much more diverse. So I'm hoping that that's due at least in part of what we're doing from a design standpoint. But it's the content, of course, that really means, means the most. What, what character? Oh, okay. It's like, <laughs> like I'm not sure. <laughs> like... Hi. Um, 
the, I don't believe there was any research before or after the logo redesign. Um, there was a lot of research done after we began to make, uh, after the campaign went out. Um, you know, one of the great things about living in a world where we're so interconnected is you get almost instantaneous feedback on anything you do. And that our audience tends to be so, um, uh, so engaged with our content. If we have a newsletter that has like a poorly constructed sentence, not even a mistake, we will get uh, a multitude of letters from English professors and, and, and others from New York telling us how badly we did and phone calls. So we saw a lot of really positive feedback. Of course, there are people who don't like anything that you do, and there's a folk, people who don't get it. Um, but by and large, if you looked at, um, I, I you know, would, would follow what people were saying about it on, on Twitter and Instagram, and you'd see the ads posted. One person said, I'm upping my donation to WNYC for no other reason than this. And it was a picture of the ad with, with Putin on it. I'm like, OK, that's, that's good. Um, more importantly, too, I think a lot of what we're doing, particularly in, in audio, uh, we find that it's changed the way everybody else in the industry does audio. If you've heard, um, I really like the, uh, New York Times' uh, daily podcast, the morning podcast. If you listen to it, it sounds exactly like everything we do. Part of it is because there's a diaspora of, of talent from WNYC, which has landed in other places and kind of bringing a lot of that DNA with them. Uh, but uh, people like Jad Abumrad, who really um, and uh, sort of set the tone for what narrative audio sounds like today. Well, yeah, that's a really great question. You know, we're lucky to be mission driven. We're not driven by profit. We don't have to report earnings to, you know, Wall Street every quarter. Um, and we can use our listener base. We have like 260,000 members in New York, I believe, and about 3 million listeners, you know, in the metro area um, to, uh, you know, for, for to drive them to do good for society. And that's what we're really trying to do. We have a lot of projects that we do. We call them engagement projects, where we ask our listeners to participate in something that we're doing. And uh, we do this across the podcast portfolio as well. Um, Manu Somarodi, uh, who does the Note to Self podcast, uh, now has a book called Bored and Brilliant, which is out, um, did several experiments um, around privacy and asking people like how they can take back their internet privacy. Do they really control the way you are presented online and where your information is going? And we're able to get people to you know, uh, act and, and help each other figure out how to set their privacy settings properly. Um, on the news side, uh, we, um, uh, there's so many examples, it's like hard to pick one to choose. We, like we um, just had a, uh, series we called We the Commuters, and it was about all these frustrated New Yorkers who are sick and tired of like all the trains being laid and getting stuck in the tunnels and on and on and on. And we solicited all these different questions from listeners and then actually got one of our listeners to act as an ambassador for the whole thing and march on down to the uh, headquarters of the MTA during one of their big meetings and present, you know, here are the demands from New Yorkers, here's what New Yorkers want to know. And, um, it wasn't just a uh, sort of a stunt. It was what we try to do. We try to get people civically involved with their with their li with, the, with the government and uh, with the city that we call home. So, oh yeah. What was the outcome? Well, <laughs> the commissioners heard what we what what the people of New York said. Um, will it change immediately? No. But what we can do is hold people's feet to fire, and we could you know, speak truth to power and try to be a conduit for the mood of the city and, and transmit that off to people who are in power. Thank you. Sure. Great, and I got lots of swag, so. So we had swag in a bag. So you can go home carrying a little bit of our design on your on yourselves. So. That's fantastic.
<laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.